Hello, everybody. How are you today? Welcome back for another Bible reading. As you know, we've been going through the book of Romans, and we have been in Romans chapter 8. And we did the first, oh, a little bit more than half of Romans chapter 8. We did verses 1 through 30 the last time we were together. <clears throat> but because it was such a long chapter, and this isn't actually a story, we decided to sort of break it up. So now we're going to do the last part of chapter 8. For those of you joining one of these videos for the first time, welcome. Here's what we do here. We go through the different stories of the Bible for people who don't know them. Maybe you've never read the Bible. You only know what somebody's told you about it. Maybe you have forgotten the stories in the Bible. Whatever the reason, we go through them so that you know what it says because we believe that it is the right of every person to know what it says in this book, cover to cover. It's your right to know what it says. You don't have to take somebody else's word for it. You don't have to um, be lied to. You can know for yourself exactly what it says and make decisions for yourself. Well, we've been doing Romans, and Romans, as you know, is a book of writings from Paul. Paul was a man who at one time, was a Jewish man, who at one time was killing Christians because he didn't think they were right. And, um, you know, the Christians were informing people of the truth that Jesus had died, risen from the dead, and that he was the Messiah. Well, that made Paul mad, so he was going to kill people. But on his way to go kill some people in Damascus, he had what is known as the Damascus Road Experience, where Jesus came to him, and he met Jesus, and now he's turned his life completely around, and instead of killing Christians, he's teaching people how to live for Jesus. Now we are going to start with verse 31 of chapter 8. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He did not even spare his own son, but offered him up for us all. How will he not also with him grant us everything? Who can bring an accusation against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is the one who died. But even more has been raised. He also is at the right hand of God and intercedes for us. Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Can affliction or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger of sword? As it is written, because of you, we are being put to death all day long. We are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. That's the end of chapter 8. That was real short. What we're going to do is look at each one of these verses we're going to break them down a little bit and look at each one of them to see exactly what Paul is trying to talk to us here. Remember, there were the people believed still, many of the Jews still believed that the only way to obtain favor with God was through the law and all of the, the things that they had to do in order to fulfill the law. But Paul is explaining to them that you are no longer under the law, you are under grace, that Jesus has come to remove the penalty, the penalty, not the sin, but the penalty of sin. He's come to forgive you for your sins. If you turn to Jesus, if you accept him as Lord of your life, if you repent for your sins, which means turn away from them and follow Jesus, then he is faithful and just to forgive you. And Paul is trying so hard to explain this to them. So in this section here, he says, what then are we to say about these things? Meaning the things that he's already spoken about. If God is for us, who is against us? In other words, the things of this world, if somebody comes against us, if God's for us, those things won't prevail. Now, they might prevail in the flesh. People can kill you. 
People can harm you. It happens. But in the spiritual realm, nothing can come against you. You belong to God. He did not even spare his own son, but offered him up for us all. He's explaining here, this is how much God loves us. This is how much he wants to be in relationship with us. He loves his creation. In John 3, 16, it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's Jesus. Whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. That's how much God loves us so much that he gave us his son. How many of you love another person so much that you would sacrifice your own child for them? Well, God did that for us. How will he not also with him grant us everything? In other words, he loves us so much. He already gave us his son. Why wouldn't he give us a beautiful spiritual life and eternity? Why wouldn't he have good plans for us? Why would he want to hold us captives and slaves to this hokey pokey law that says we must appease God? You know, we didn't do anything to appease God and he still sent his son. The word says, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus looked at humanity and said, I love them so much that I'm going to sacrifice my own son for them to save them. Who can bring an accusation against God's elect? In other words, who can, who can accuse us of being evil if God has saved us and spared us? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Certainly isn't God. Christ Jesus is the one who died, but even more has been raised. He also is at the right hand of God and intercedes for us. You see, when Jesus died and rose again and went to sit on the right hand of his father, he pleads on our behalf. He intercedes for us. He sees everything that we go through and he talks to Father, his father God for us and intercedes on our behalf. Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Can affliction or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? In other words, if all of these things were to happen to us, would that mean that Christ would no longer love us? Absolutely not. Because nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. That's what he's explaining here. As it is written, and he refers to um, some other scripture out of the Old Testament, because of you, we are being put to death all day, all day long. We are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. You see, we might have to go through some of these things in this lifetime, but that doesn't mean that we have been separated from the love of God. He still loves us no matter what. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. More than conquerors. Now, when you think of a conqueror, you think of a mighty strong person who just defeated somebody else in battle. There may be some fleshly, earthly battles that we don't conquer. Maybe you don't get that job that you wanted. Maybe you're falling behind on your bills. Maybe, um, maybe you have an illness in your life. Maybe there are several things happening around you that you don't care for. Does this necessarily mean that you're going to defeat every single one of those things in your life? No, I'm sorry. Being a Christian doesn't mean that you get to make magic wishes and they all come true. That just doesn't happen. We are more than conquerors. It does not say that we are conquerors. It says we are more than conquerors. Well, what could be more than conquering something in the flesh? It means that we have a place in eternity with Jesus in the spiritual. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. There is nothing, nothing that can come along and take you away from the love that God has for you. He loves mankind so much, so much that he gave his own son, his very own son he sacrificed. There is nothing that can come along in this world and put a wedge between the love that God has for you and you. God is constantly pursuing you with love. He loves you and he wants to be with you. And there is nothing that will ever make him stop loving you. Now you can reject God. 
You can. And people sometimes ask this question, how can a loving God send people to hell? That has nothing to do with whether he loves you or not. He loves you very much. You know, there are there were times when I was raising my children that I had to discipline them. And sometimes it broke my heart to have to do that. You know, I caught them maybe doing something they weren't supposed to. And when they were real little, maybe they got spankings and then timeouts and then grounding, you know, different, different things that punishment that was appropriate for the level of crime they may have committed. And sometimes it really broke my heart. I didn't want to have to ground them from certain things because I didn't want them to be disappointed that they didn't get to participate in those things. But I wanted them to grow up to be decent, wonderful, kind human beings. And so I had to exercise discipline. God has boundaries and limits. His love for us is unconditional, but that doesn't give us the right to walk all over God. He says what he means and he means what he says. And he says that the people who accept this love that he has for us which was sending his son, Jesus Christ, the people who accept Jesus Christ as Lord of their life and put him first and foremost, those are the ones that he's going to give the prize of eternal life to. That doesn't mean he doesn't love you. That is the end of Romans chapter eight. I really hope you learned something. I hope you're learning something throughout all of Romans. We only have a few more chapters left in this, and then we'll get back to doing some stories. But I felt that this was a pretty important book, and it's a good way for you to learn how to study. Remember, there are three ways I always tell you to look at these things. One, what does it say? You have to have reading comprehension. You have the right to know what it says in here. Two, you have to look at everything in context, the history in which it was written, understand the culture, the reason why it was written. And three, what, if anything, is it saying to us today? This is saying a lot to us today, just like it said a lot to the people back then. It's saying a lot to us today. And I'm going to leave it up to you to figure out exactly what it is saying to you. I want you to take some time, find your Bible. If you don't have one, you can always turn on the Bible app. Everybody's got cell phones and computers now with apps. And you can download the Bible app for free and go to Romans chapter 8 or just the whole book of Romans for that matter, and start studying on your own. Start learning about these things. This is this is too much for me to just teach you in just, you know, these little mini, mini sermonettes, if you will. And I encourage you to study these things and ask yourself the ever important question, God, what are you trying to say to me? To me. What does it say to me? Well, in the meantime, I hope you got something out of this. I hope that you can spend the rest of your day and and this weekend coming up knowing that there is nothing that will keep God from loving you. Nothing. So have a great day. I look forward to us being together next time. God bless you.